So if you were to run this at this point in Chrome or Firefox, uh, you should get something that looks something like this. And if I actually also view it in the developer tools, it's something like that. So you should not see anything about the template, obviously, because it's a separate section that exists with, with its own ID, and we can't get to it unless we have a link to it. So I'll do one more thing here. I will add um, icons to that nav bar, and then we will create the art screen and the computer screen. We can do that pretty fast because we can just copy what exists for the home screen and paste it for an art and computers. So back on the code, I want to also add some icons here. So to the A href, after the href, we will add data icon. Data icon home. And then for art, we have a pencil, which is edit. It's not called pencil, but it's in it's a pencil. And then for computers, there's a gear. These can be customized, of course. This is completely optional, but notice how I have added these extra spaces on the data icons so that they line up. That's completely superfluous, but I did that because I like how it looks. It did add two extra empty spaces, but I like how those columns seem to line up. Data icon, href, a tag, etc. While I'm here, I can also add um, animations. If we don't add animations or transitions to these, to these links, they get the automatic fade transition, which works fine, but it's a little boring. So I'm going to add data icon, um, we'll do turn. It's like a page turn. We won't be able to see these animations yet because there's actually no screens that exist of art and computers. want to create a an art screen and a computer screen well they're going to look very similar to home so i'm going to copy and paste all of my code of home i do have this section that i can use if i want this section template that I can reuse for other purposes. But because I want home, art, and PC to look the same, interface one, here's interface one. So I'm going to copy. First, what I'll do is add some comments here, because as we build this up, this will have a lot to look at. I'm going to copy that. But first, I'll add some comments here. Start home section and home section.
this will be useful because I'm about to copy and paste two times. I'm going to copy this whole section, which is my home. It's got a it's got a setup footer. It's got a setup main article. It's got a setup navbar. Most importantly, because I don't want to retype that two more times. So that section, yes. Good point. Ten points. Ten points for you, Alex. Minus ten for everyone else because no one else mentioned it. Transition. Sorry about that. Data transition. Data icon obviously is the icon, and data transition is the animation. Okay, so that I will copy and paste. Although that defines interface 1, I will copy it in my case from about line 11 to 28. If your line numbers don't line up, remember I'm going from section to section. So I will make a new line and paste. So now I've got a complete copy of the home section from line 11 to 28, which I've then pasted the section again. Now this is start of art, end of art. That's just a comment. What needs to change, very importantly, the ID. I cannot use the same ID anymore. That ID for home is home. The ID for art, what should it be? Art, because I'm also referencing it right here in the nav bar. So this new section that I just pasted, ID equals art. Might as well also, instead of it saying instead of it saying the exact same thing up on the header. We could, we could leave the app name visible on every screen, but I'm going to take advantage of, I know already that I'm on this app from the home screen. I'm going to take advantage of using the header space to then say something like art classes. And then further, well, we don't need welcome anymore in the art section. We'll say take an art class. It's just other content. We're going to fill in the details, of course. But here now I have a whole new section, a whole new screen, another copy of Interface 1 with a couple quick tweaks. Very important to change your ID. Content-wise is another matter, but the ID must be changed. I still have home section in memory. One thing that I notice that a lot of people do is when you copy and paste something, you don't have to copy it again if you're pasting the same thing. Once you copy something, it stays in memory until you copy something else. Section is still in memory. Therefore, I can paste again, and that will paste the home section again, which then I will change. So after the end of art section, I just paste again. I don't have to copy again. It's in memory. This is now the start of PC section. This is the end of PC section. And the ID needs to be changed to PC. H1, I can put PC classes. I'll oh, just do computer classes because some people will think only PC. Nope, Mac and PC. Mac and Windows computer classes. And instead of it saying welcome on this brand new PC screen, enroll, or let's say something like learn about computers. So this is pretty elementary. It's copying and pasting, changing a couple of simple things. The result is that I now have a home screen. I can click on Art. Page turns. I'm in the Art class. Take an Art class. I click Computers. I'm in the Computers section. Learn about computers. I click on Home. 
goes back to home. So if you have your home section working, these are the two sections zoom by because you just need to change a couple of little things. Let's pause right there. You should get something like I just showed you. If you misspelled something, that's most likely the culprit for it not working. Triple check your spelling or call me over there when I do a little pause. Thank you. 
Okay, so we were what we were doing here. Hopefully, you've got it to the point where it um, lets you go from these different screens to these different screens. I'm kind of not liking the turn animation actually. So this is something perhaps that I could have decided upon in the design phase, but it doesn't always happen that way. So let me show you a, a trick here. I need to change these so now it, that it uh, it flips. I want to do a flip instead of a turn. Okay, so that's really easy to do. What I would do is, notice it says up here, data transition equals turn. Well, I would just change that to flip. But before you do that, I need to do it three times on the home screen, and three times in the art screen, and three times in the PC screen. Well, that's only nine things I need to change. But if you had copied and pasted this many times and you have 17 things to change, now that's annoying. So one of the most powerful things that any civilized code editor lets you do is find and replace. Anything will have a find. Find in my lines of code this. But what really matters is a find and replace. This is a perfect example of that. If you'd like to do this, let's do this. If you, if you like the turn, leave the turn. But here's how I would replace nine things. Uh, I'm going to go back to the top of my screen where I have the first set of things I need to change. This method of find and replace is not always perfect. You have to sometimes really think about it. But this will let you do what computers are very good at, which is repetition. I need to do the same thing nine times. If you go up to the search menu, you have replace. Control F in most software is find, and in Notepad so it is, but replace Control H. I highly recommend you memorize that. You can also get to it by doing Control F for find, and then you have replace tab. But I would recommend memorize Control H. And the way this works is, if I have something selected, before I go to replace, that's helpful because then when I go to replace, it thinks, okay, you want to replace turn with something. 
if I didn't have anything selected, if I had for whatever reason uh, href selected and I go to replace, it thinks you want to replace href, so just be careful. But the point is, it says find what, replace with what. Super easy at this point, we want to replace turn with flip. So wherever there is a mention of the word turn, replace it with flip. However, depending on the complexity of our project, we may want turn sometimes and flip other times. Before I go turn them all to flip, a little useful thing is under find, I have a count, and this will tell me that term, turn, is found nine times. That's what I expect. I use turn nine times. But if we have, for whatever reason, I needed to, whoops, I wrote href and I needed source, that could cause big problems if I replace. Because if I search, how many times did I use href? Ten times. And I only expected it twice. So this find and replace is not always foolproof. That's why this find and replace screen is kind of complex. Find what, replace what. Match whole word only, match case, wrap around. So if I had something, let's say, flip, capital F, and I needed to replace that with, uh, you know, slide, and I did match case, this would only target flips with a capital F. If I were to count capital F flips, zero, because I've only written flip in lower case. So sometimes this match case is useful. If I have capital letters in the word I'm trying to replace, only focus on those. Uh, what could happen is I, I might have um, I might have flip uh, as code, but in the regular content I have mentioned Flipper the dolphin. If I'm trying to do replace flip with slide, it's going to replace Flipper the dolphin's name with slide, unless I do match whole word. So that way, it will only target words that are flip and not words that are flipper or flippant. So be careful about that. Without match whole word, flip is going to replace instances of something called flip, something called flipper, something called flipping, something called flippant. So match the whole word, match the case. And wrap around just means, you know, wherever your mouse cursor is, start there, and if you get to the end, wrap to the top to keep doing it. In what direction? Up or down? Um, we have also, if I had made a selection first, I can activate in selection. So if I have a selection of 12 lines, and in those 12 lines only I want to replace flip with slide, I can make a selection and select in selection. Even more complex then is what kind of search to do normal is most of what the time you'll be doing. Extended are other ones like a line break and a tab. We can replace tabs. Backslash T. And I wish there was like a link to show you all the possible extended characters. We have to go look those up. Escape characters. But backslash T will find instances of tabs and replace them with three spaces, let's say. Because what I can do here, if I go to extended, and then add a backslash T. Replace all instances of tabs with one, two, three spaces. You can do that. And regex is complex. Who knows how to use regex? One person. Okay, teach, teach us at some point. But re regular expressions are a very complex way to further target strings of data. You can go to regex.com or something and it'll teach you how to do it because it's complex. It's like uh, doing uh, conditional statements inside of a very esoteric uh, bit of, of coding. Most of us will want normal. 
All of that to say that I want to replace, in my case, instances of the turn with instances of flip. So then we've got replace all. We can replace one at a time. We can replace everything in this document. I may have 10 documents open. Replace all in all open documents. Very powerful, very dangerous <coughs> also. I want to turn my flips into turns. Backwards, turns into flips. So turn into flip. Um, you can undo this, of course, but I'll do a replace all. It told me at the bottom nine instances were replaced, nine occurrences. And looking here, I see, I see that data transition flip, 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 flip everywhere. So now if I see that result, there's a flip. You can do flip, slide, anything you want, but on each of those nine instances you have to have the transition. We don't need to do it now, but again, we'll probably need to do it later and just to think about it like this. What if I decided to change the edit icon, instead of the, it being an edit, I want it to be a grid. Well, this is again the example that I may have the word edit in more than one place that is not actual code. So that would be an example where I would need to get more creative. If I want to change it from edit to grid, I want the grid icon. I need to be more creative here. Well, these are lowercase but I use the word edit lowercase elsewhere. Okay, I'm kind of stuck. Here's one way this is, this is ingenious, because you have to think outside the box. There's only the instances of the word edit being used, in this case, when there is also data-icon edit. And so, if I set myself up like this, that will find instances of this piece of code and replace it with that piece of code. I did not end the quote. No matter. It, that original quote will be left alone. It will stay there. I can fully, to kind of, you know, uh, deal with my OCD, put the quote there to confirm, but we won't need to do that sometimes. It'll only replace what you told it to replace. So that we're going to do this later on. Not now. Um, you can, if you want to, to test it out. But that will then... I'm thinking outside the box. I want to change that. But because of the context, I'm able to target that. And then just to kind of confirm it, if you click a find count first, okay, it's only going to change three things. Plain old edit might have changed 12 things where I used the word edit as the word edit and not the code edit. If I do that and check the result, those have become grids. I didn't want it, so undo, and it'll undo all of those three changes. I even if this changed 40 things, one undo right afterward will undo all of those changes. So again, a civilized code editor should let you do find and replace. Now I have a good transition that I like. We'll do one more thing about aesthetics. Um, we're gonna we're gonna play this shell game. You know when when someone um, when someone kind of where did the where did the where did the marble go. I'm going to put it in the shells, and then we flip the shells around all over the place. Which one is it in? Well, I'm kind of doing that right here. I'm kind of flipping around. Um, and I'm going to ask you, without thinking too hard, what screen did I land on? What screen am I on? What was the indicator that told you that? My eyesight is not an indicator. But yes, I see what you're saying. It says there, art. Underneath, but also underneath. Tab? 
well, the tab is not going to be visible when we're a real app. So we have to rely with what's in the actual interface. And it's obvious that this says art, and this says art classes. But what if we had some other message? What if we had left that as my SDCE, and we didn't explicitly say take an art class? If we didn't, we could do some kind of hover, or what, what I'm getting at is that this navbar itself is not telling you. It's not highlighted. It's not telling you what screen you're in. So let's set up these to be highlighted to tell us, I'm in the art screen. I'm in the home screen. And this is part of the whole concept of user experience, which we'll be talking about at different points. User experience is how do we set up a project that, look, that, is, that gives the user a good experience. And one is simply to orient them. What screen am I in? I'm designing the app. I know what screen I'm in. But when a person visits my app, they have to learn how does my app work and what are the cues and markers to tell me where am I at. A simple way is to simply highlight the button of the screen that we're in. Let's start with the home button. Notice how it does highlight when you kind of switch between screens. I want the highlight to stay when I'm in the home screen. We can do that pretty easily through the code. So we'll get back to the to notepad. We'll start off first on about line uh, 16, which is where our home button is at. We need to add a class. There is a built-in, there are two built-in jQuery mobile classes that do that. They keep a button highlighted uh, so that we can tell that it's been clicked. So we'll add a new attribute. We've got data icon, data transition, we'll add class. And remember, I like to add a class or an ID as the last attribute of an element. We have the UI-BTN-Active. That'll keep the button active. That'll, that'll actually, that'll highlight the button. Space, make sure you're still in the quotes, space UI dash state dash persist. These are two separate classes. In the jQuery mobile file, uh, there is a definition of dot UI dash button active and whatever definition it is. And on another line, there's a dot UI dash state dot persist. We're using both of these classes at once. So there's a space between them. Use the active class and use the persist class. And the point of that is when you see your result in the browser, home, if you refresh, home is automatically highlighted. It stays highlighted. This gives you the indicator that I'm on the home screen. I need to do the exact same thing for the art button and the computer button in their respective screens. So I'm going to copy I'm going to copy this class from home and go to my art section and paste it into my art button. Then I'll paste it by going to my PC section and pasting it onto the PC button. So it's a UI, not a U1, a UI. Dash BTN, they didn't spell button completely, it's just BTN. So we'll go over to the art section, art button, paste the exact same thing. Then computers, paste there. Like on 
yes, that, that, that's how I ended up doing it. I did, I, I, that's what I searched. I, I figured out what word it was and then did a find and a replace. Yeah, big time saver. So you, you could do that as well. Right now it was only two changes, but yeah, what if I needed to do this active for seven more screens so I can get more complex and, and do it like... Um, I'd have to do something like this. I'm going to start like this and end like that. You see, I'm searching for I'm searching for data transition flip art, never mind the rest. And I'm replacing that with data transition flip again or else it will go away. So I'm keeping the original, I'm adding the class, and then I'm finishing up art. So that's a way to do that with seven instances. Right now we did two easily, class, we pasted class. But if I had already seven screens, this might be a way to do it. Find versions where there is no class, and then replace it. So that gives us then these that. Let's um, let's fill in uh, these screens a little bit more. They're pretty bare. So what we're going to do is borrow some text and some graphics from the official website of the college. So I'm going to go to sdce.edu Graphics. Are we able to? Are these are easy to grab. The old version of the site had had us grab these a little easier, but um, well, we can always inspect and find where that actual graphic is. I didn't check before doing this part of it, so um, there's no easy like right-click save graphic here. It looks like we'll have to dig around in their code. One way to do this, however, maybe just for kind of practice, we can do this. Uh, I'm gonna. I want to borrow some of these graphics. Each one of these individual graphics. What I could do is on the keyboard. If you press Print Screen on the top right corner. That took a screenshot of the whole screen. On the Mac, if you do Shift Command 3, that takes a screenshot. But I want to take a screenshot of all of this. Just press Print Screen. And then I can go to the uh, Start menu and load Paint. This will be a lot faster than Photoshop. And then Control V to paste. 
so that copies the screen at that moment and then what I can do with that is just you know select the graphic crop that so uh, we won't spend too much on this but I want to get some graphics a graphic or two and you see I can print screen from anything that I see then paste into paint and then make a selection of the graphic you want to keep and you can click crop so maybe if you see some of these screens print screen them and think in terms about do any of these screens relate to what our sections are? I got a home screen, an art screen, a computer screen. We'll start off with those but try to find some graphics from our website or anywhere else that you want and we will save those graphics into your project folder. You don't have to save them anywhere complex, just save them in the project folder. You can make a subfolder for images if you want, but I'm going to start with that graphic and I'll, and I'll save it into my project. Call that um, like welcome dot ping Use that one for art. So based on these pictures here, I'm going to save three pictures, and then I think we have some official logos that we can get from the website. Where did they put those? Here we go, style guide and logos. So we have some official logos of the college. You can get those from organization, style guide and logos. using graphics and I'm going to download them into the project because I just want to have some graphics to work with. We changed our logo recently, I believe. The old one used to be like a um, like a bicycle spoke kind of design, kind of. And when it was a small app icon, it looked a little uh, not so good because the lines were so small. This newer one is in the newer style of a modern design, a flat design and such. So when it's a nice little icon, it still looks good. So I'm going to go with maybe a couple of these. I like these two, the vertical one and the horizontal one. So the one that you want is the ping version, the high quality ping CE logo with district seal and the horizontal one, maybe, whichever one of those that you like. And those are found inside of the organization tab, style guide, and logos. So I'm putting CE, CE do seal vertical and this one.
So in my project, I've got the index file, the supporting files, the CSS and the JavaScript, and then these brand new graphics that I that I put in there. So some welcome graphic, art, PC, a couple of those logos. Good point. Uh, we've got an images folder. I, I kind of forgot about it, but we could leave them in the root. That's fine. We just need to adjust our path. But I think it, it would make sense to put them in images since we have an images folder. So yeah, I'm going to put those images in an images folder. That images folder came from our jQuery mobile. We will just reuse it. So we will put those graphics in the images folder. So if I want to display that image, that, that initial image, that welcome image, after I download my images into the images folder, we then write a little code to display the image. In the home section, in the article, after the paragraph, after the heading one, we can create a paragraph to display the image. Source images slash welcome dot ping. Based on that, I could also put that code into my art screen and my PC screen, and I have a couple of graphics for that. Styling them and all of that will come to the point of CSS. Right now I'm kind of setting up structure. Add the same code <coughs> over to my art screen. This time I'm pointing it to my art graphic. I put it in an images folder, so my source needs to say source. Uh, the source that is needs to point to the images folder slash art dot ping file. So centering this and making it sure it fits well on the screen, we'll get to that when we deal with CSS. I then want to put a little bit of text below the graphic. So let's see if we can find some text that we can borrow, just a simple copy and paste. Educational access and lifelong learning. Yeah, that'll, that'll be fine. You can copy that bit of text. We need a paragraph for that text in our code on the home screen. On the home screen I've got the welcome ping and then I'll make another paragraph. 
just paste that in from the website. So this art screen here is going to be the one of the first things we see. We can add more content and other content later. On the art screen, I want to introduce a new element here, a, uh, a new jQuery mobile widget, a new another way to display information. So in the art section, I want to list some possible classes. Uh, we have this cool jQuery mobile widget, which will let, which is a collapsible element, which will let us open and close things, kind of like an accordion. So I can have a list of five classes, and if the person chooses to see more information about one of the classes, they click on that one, and then it opens up to display more. So in the art classes section, we're going to create a collapsible element. We can of course go to jQuery mobile to look up all the details of it, but here's want to start off with. Go to your section of art. After your picture, we're going to create a div. So if you recall, a div is a generic container. Well, we're going to add some data roles. We're going to add some data elements. Thanks to jQuery Mobile, they will then be upgraded to something more interesting. This has a data role of collapsible dash set. Inside of this, I can then add multiple elements that open and close. Inside of, inside of the div, we have another div with the data role simply of collapsible, and then all of the content that we want to open and close, further in H3. Item 1. This is just some generic placeholder content for the moment. Before we add the real content, you can check out the, the browser. So in the art screen, we're going to have something that is a set of collapsible elements. We have one collapsible element so far. You should see when you run it, it'll say item 1. It'll look like a button. You click it, and then it'll open up to reveal gibberish for the moment. But what could be inside of that is real text, pictures, video, other elements, a calendar. And then we'll add another one. We'll add an item 2, an item 3, an item 4. What would be class 1, class 2, whatever. I don't want to see so far if it works at this point. Let me check. Let me confirm my code, and then we'll I'll get back to it. It should work by being in the art section. I have item one. And I click on that, it opens up to have content. It's already designed and it has the rollover and all that great stuff because of the data roles, because of jQuery Mobile. So that means if I want a whole new item, I just need to copy 
this chunk of a collapsible element, copy and paste, into the same collapsible set. And I can have as many collapsible items as I want. So just for practice, three of them. Obviously item one, item two, item three. All three of those should be inside of the collapsible set for this to work. If you don't put it in there, it won't be it won't behave how you expect. Yes, H1 should really only be used once, the very first header. But everything else can be reused if the concept makes sense. This makes sense because all three of these items are on the same level of importance, so they're all H3s. We have the H4, which is the footer. And then the welcome is the... Yeah. A, that should sorry that should have been H two yeah that should have been an H two only the top item in the header should have been an H one okay. it'll work but should have been an H two now that I look at it So home screen, art screen, item one, item two. Only one is open at a time, and that that's that makes sense. I could have here a listing of various elements, classes, whatever, and then I can put whatever I want into these collapsible elements, and then the person chooses to see what's inside of it when they click. Only one of them is open at a time. As these open up and the screen changes and I scroll, my header and footer should not scroll away. That was having the data position fixed. I didn't really see that on home because everything fits on one screen. Once you get into these other screens that have more content, data position fixed might be something that you want. Yes. I have activated here in the browser. I pressed F12 to bring up the developer tools, and then I activated the. Um, then I activated up here the device toolbar so that it, so that it behaves like a device. It may be up unresponsive, and I put it on the Galaxy 5, and now it looks like a little fingertip, kind of. It doesn't matter if you have that, you know, if you still have just the mouse. But. So this that we just created is the collapsible widget. Uh, we'll take a quick look at the documentation of jQuery Mobile to see what this is and how it works. So if you go to the browser, jQueryMobile.com, we'll look at demos. So 
on your tab bar at the top, Demos, the latest stable version, and this element that we're looking at is collapsible. There's collapsible and collapsible set. Uh, I'm going to look at collapsible set first. An accordion is created by jQuery Mobile by grouping a series of individual collapsibles into a set. So if we look at the simply collapsible, it's just one thing that opens up. We did a set because we wanted multiple things to open up grouped together conceptually. Collapsible sets are with the same markup as an individual collapsible, which have a heading followed by the content. By adding a parent wrapper of a data role collapsible set, oh, I notice there's no dash on this one. Is that a typo? That's a... That's, huh, it may be with dash or without dash. Attribute to the collapsible, they will be visually grouped and they will behave like an accordion, so only one can open at a time. Viewing source gives you that, and I see collapsible set without a dash. I wonder, we did with a dash. I wonder which is the more correct one. Probably without a dash. Inset versus full width. For full width collapsibles without corners, add a data inset equals false attribute to the set. So then what that does is the difference. This is an inset style that you can see the edges of it rounded edges. If you do instead data inset false, this will extend all the way to the edge of your screen without clear indicators of where it ends. That's another style of what you can do, and that is simply data inset false. A mini version, or more compact, data mini equals true. Icons, if you want different icons there on the left, Data, icon, data collapsed icon, data expanded icon. So we need the data role of collapsible set. Data collapsed icon. So then we specify an icon. Data expanded icon, another icon. It can be added to the individual one as well. To the whole collapsible set, we can do the general collapsed and expanded, and then to the individual um, collapsibles, we can do the collapsed icon and the expanded icon. So notice how here looks like that, looks like that, here looks like that, like that. Our default is the plus symbols, minus symbols. We can change the position of the uh, of those icons, right, left, bottom, top, just view source. We can play with those corners. If we don't want rounded corners, data corners equals false. Themes we'll deal with later, changing the color. I would recommend you play with those, maybe the icons, maybe you could do the inset, but our result is, is this, this is fine. The content inside of it, we'll add content later, we're just creating structure. The idea is in the art screen, we're going to list a name of a class with content, another <coughs> class, other content, maybe the, maybe the name of the instructor, the meeting times, their photo. Computers, we're going to do something similar but with a different element. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the main lecture to give you a little bit of sort of like in-class homework for you to do something here. Um, I would like for you on the computer screen, same kind of concept that we're going to list some fictional classes, like three classes, but not with a collapsible. I want you to research the list view widget in jQuery Mobile and create a list of three fictional computer classes in the in the in the computer screen. 
So I'm going to end the main lecture to give us some time to work on that. Once you think you figured it out, call me over and I'll just give you a quick check mark because I have to do homework once in a while if you're going to get a certificate. So we're going to do a little in-class work. Try to see if you can get that done before you, know, before you leave. So check out the list view widget. See how it works. Not complicated. And then add a list view to the computer screen and make up three classes. They don't have to really work and go show you anything meaningful. But see if you can create three fictional listings of a class based on the list view widget.